welcome back. If you're just joining us, you are tuned into The Foxworth Theory, and I am your host, Eugenia Foxworth. And today's guest is the fantastic and amazing Angelo Ellerby. Now, Angelo, what are your priorities today for Double Exposure Media? My priorities today and 365 days out of the year is always God first. If God is first, I absolutely do not have to make a plan. He makes the plan for me. And I'm thankful for his plan. I don't think the future, I think today. And every day is a day of being granted to me. And so my firm has always existed on the prayer of God and what he allows me to do. And I'm thankful for that. I did not cut out. You have to understand, my business was built from my mother's basement in Newark, New Jersey. I went on to, uh, to two major record companies. One was Chrysalis, where I was the senior director of publicity. And the other was Island Black Music. Now, Double Exposure is still existing. I'm still working. I'm working at, I'm working at, there was one young lady, Kathy, was in my mother's basement every single day while I went to New York City. And I started working for Chrysalis as a senior director. Uh, I worked with like uh, Pat Benatar. And that was really strange back in that time because we as Blacks were not allowed to deal with crossover artists. But Angelo maneuvered himself to be on the executive floor when I was supposed to be on the bottom floor in the black music department, but they wanted to put me in a cubicle and I couldn't do a cubicle because I had spoiled myself to have this place of concentration. So I positioned myself on the executive floor for which I met the chairman working late at night. And he invited me, he came in and he talked to me every night. Then he invited me into the boardroom. And when I walked in the boardroom, all of these people of another color said to me, I think you're in the wrong meeting, Angelo. And he stood up six foot seven and said, no, he is in the right meeting. I escalated from being senior director to vice president uh, of publicity. I, I was still now running double exposure in the basement. So every night I would leave about 11 o'clock from the record label, come home, do what I need to do. I'm living in Newark. So I had to get on the train late at night and do what I needed to do. But that was keeping your eyes on the prize. And it, I always remember my mother saying, if you make a step, God's going to make the other step for you. It wasn't about the money. It's never been about the money for me. It's always been about the craft and winning. And it's not important that you win every race. It's just important that you stay in the race. If you stay in the race, eventually you will win. And that's. That was the key thing. So I left Chrysalis Records and I had great relationships with the clients. And it was a young guy by the name of Roland Clark, had a big club record. And his manager was, his name was Doug Breitbart. He was an attorney at law. And I told him that I was leaving and I wanted to go on and further develop my firm. He says, well, you know, I have an office on 7th Avenue. He says, if you want a cubicle there. So we went into the cubicle, me, myself, and I went into the, that was my staff, me, myself, and I, and Kathy in Newark. And I began to do small little projects like Brenda K. Starr and this one, all the new artists that were coming up. And one day I'm walking down the street next door to where I was. I looked up at 846 7th Avenue. And they had, that was on 54th Street, they had a floor. Now, I could never go up there being of this color and think that they were going to rent this facility to me. No, 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 no. I was smart enough to understand that wasn't going to happen. So what I needed to do is that I called my Italian, because it was we were up on a, a, from a restaurant, Italian restaurant. The owner was Italian. So my name is Angelo Antonio Ellerby. So I called my lawyer. He came up with his assistant, was up the same pigmentation. They took pictures, came back downstairs, showed me the pictures. I said, I want the place. It was a whole floor. 
I didn't have a nickel or a dime. I had nothing, but I had faith. So I'm walking down 7th Avenue and I run into Bowlegged Lou. And this is a full force. And he says, you know, Angel, we're looking for a deal. Da, 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 da. I got a phone call from somebody. I said, well, would you like to do an international deal with uh, with uh, Bowlegged Lou? He said, yeah. So I was able to get, I think it was $30,000. So I went in and paid three months of my rent. I signed a five-year lease. We moved in. No money. <laughs> But I knew the importance of creating the illusion. I was I think I was the only black business on Seventh Avenue at that time. I hired 18 people. No money. No money. No money. So you, nobody can tell me about the power of God. Absolutely. I'm telling you, you cannot ever tell me that God does not provide. Because if you make the step. You believe in him. You're encouraged by his work and his word. He'll take you through every time. Now, I'm not going to tell you. My life has been an elevator ride. No, it's been an escalator ride. It goes up. It stops. It goes up. It stops. But it's okay as long as I'm riding. Good, bad, Who or was, indifferent. I need to ask you a question. Who is Bowlegged Lou? So there's a group <laughs> called Full Force. Okay. And they are very, back in the 70s and 80s, they were very successful songwriters, producers, and also a group. So they were very popular, but very popular in the, in the United States, not necessarily abroad. So it was a good expansion for them. So once I got the $30,000, Double Exposure was started on 7th Avenue. So the little lady that was sitting in my mother's basement now could come to New York City, and we created Double Exposure. And so all of my friends, my, my very dear friend, Byron Barnes, he came, he had more, he had money, he's the one with the money. And he was telling me how fabulous that we had to make this office be. And so we did. And so we represented, my God, Mary J. Blige, Genuine, uh, Soul For Real, uh, Patra, Shabba Ranks, The Marleys. Uh, it went on and on. And then I got book deals. Then I got a movie deal from Paramount Pictures. This is somebody that came from Newark. And I can, I can just sit back and always believe that it was going to happen. I didn't know when it was going to happen, when he was going to bless me with it, but he did. And I rode that and rode that and rode that. And then I went to work for DMX. Then I went to work for this one. And I went, to, it's all about where this heart and this mind lies at. And it's not going to be easy. I had so many setbacks because of my chosen life and lifestyle. Setbacks. Um, then me being Black. Setback. I wasn't getting what the Susan Blondes or any of those established white firms were getting. Um, but I got what I had to and I made it work. And so then the, the genre of music. I started to get into gospel music. My first album that I ever did was with Karen Clark Sheard. That's when I was a senior vice president at Island Black Music. So I started with Hiram Hicks, who gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. He came in and he simply said, he gave, it was a group called Drew Hill. And he would give me all these projects. And he would say, let me just see what you can do. So you got to remember, I had a team of 18 people nine PR people, and everyone had a genre in which they were experts in. And I would sit in my staff meetings and simply say, listen to the record. Listen to the record. Oh, I don't like this. I don't. I said, you're going to have to learn to like it if you want your salary this week. Find <laughs> something about this record that you like. And everybody had to bring in five interviews. So five times, nine. So when I went back to Hiram, he said, here's the interviews. He said, how did you do this? You don't even have you don't even have their bios. I know that where they came from, Maryland. I know this. I know that. Da, 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 da. And we started to. And then after that, he offered me everything as an independent, and then asked me to come to work for his label. So now I'm on Eighth Avenue with with Island. 
my office is on 7th Avenue, and then I would go from 8th Avenue to 7th Avenue. I'll go into my office early in the morning, do what I needed to do, and then hit to be around there at 10 o'clock in the morning for Island Black Music. You take these opportunities and you make them work. And then the movies, you know, with DMX, you know, people don't understand other people to the point that everyone has a judgment on someone because they have a stigma or something. You know what? DMX was the most blessed child. Troubled, but blessed. Always spoke about God. And one of the reasons that I think we stayed together for those five years is that his centering was always on God. He would always say to me, Angel, did you pay my tithes? Not did you pay my mortgage, but did you pay my tithes? So that tells you a whole, gives you a whole list of things of where his heart really lied at. It goes on and on and on. Can I interject? Because sure. some of our audience may not necessarily know what the tithes are. Could you like explain? Sure, you know, so when, we're, when we go into our Baptist churches, uh, they ask for you to give a weekly tithe mm -hmm. one Sunday. So it's supposed to be like 10% of your gross earnings. And so he made sure that his tithes were always paid for him and for his wife. Equally, I did the same thing to my church. It's the support of the church and the per church staying in its existence. You know, it, they're a non-profit, but they have to exist. They got to pay the light bills, the gas bills, the choir directed, the, all these things has to exist and people have to get paid. And so that's how they're able to get paid through the tithing. So yeah, so it's very, very important and, and not just in black churches, it's important in all churches that we give that 10%. So yeah, now it's I, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to always be able to give back. And when you can't give financially, give from the heart. Everybody deserves a chance. I don't care who they are. Be who you are. Don't try to be the next Beyonce. Don't try to be the next Mary J. Be who you are. Your originality is what people want. And that's why for my whole entire life, I'm always going to be who I am. Not who you want me to be. Not what they want me to be. But I'm going to be what God has blessed me to be. Angelo Antonio Ellerby. And that's the greatest thing in life is to be yourself. That's the most important thing in life is to be yourself. I'm looking at your dapper outfit. Everything that you are sharing with our audience and with me, because I'm truly absorbing everything, your fashion, your attire, your way of speaking, and to tell people, well, I didn't get my, you know, I didn't go back to college to get my degree. That is important for our youth to know. And I do have a question for yes. you. In your career, what projects have meant the most to you? I'm going to be so 100% honest with you. It's a project that I'm still working on. The Angelo okay. Ellerby project. I'm still working on me. And, and I'm proud of me but I'm still working on me. There is room for improvement. There are, more, there are more things that I want to do that I have not done. Um, I'm a work in progress. Okay. Now, looking back, what were some of the first that you achieved? I mean, you've said a lot of things, but looking back, what were some of the first that you achieved? Some of the first is dancing for Alvin Ailey and designing for their 79, 1979 season. Um, some of the first was being able to be giving donations back to the HIV and AIDS, St. Michael's Hospital in Newark, New Jersey. Those are things that are very important to me because it allowed other people to live. And that's really important. Uh, it's important for me to want to always have a way of giving back, particularly when it comes to education. Edu we fight for so many tangible things in our lives, for our cars, our houses, fine clothes. But you know what? All those things can be taken away at a pop. 
but you can never take the education and the smarts. So I strive to want to educate and motivate and stimulate young people to the awareness of existing in not just the music industry, but in this life, in this society. It's really important that if we reach deep, deep down inside and just give back minutes and seconds to help the next person across that railroad track, mm -hmm. that's what's important. Yes, and you were first basically all the way around in the industry with the things that you did even when you began as a 19 year old. So I'm not gonna ask you my next question. My next question was, what prepared you to be a public relations expert? But I think- I'm gonna tell you absolutely nothing. Um, the only thing that prepared me was working and being around James M. Tume. You know, it's so funny when he got the movie offer, uh, I think it was another person that was supposed to do the public relations and they fell out or whatever. So when Tume looked at me and said, he said, oh, I guess you're going to be the publicist. I said, the what? He said, the publicist. And then he said, I said, what? Do, what is it that they, he said, well, you need to go look up in a dictionary because there was no computers back then and find mm -hmm. out what a publicist is and go to work. I did. And that's when I bought the newspapers and just started to do what I, you know, I understood that. But the selling force is, and, and this is a thing that bothers me with young publicists today, it's not a cup of instant coffee, it's brewed coffee. You can't just think that something instant is going to appear in front of you. It's called establishing and gather, gathering relationships. You have to develop relationships, not just a pitch letter, not just an email, but you gotta be able to call people up and articulate and tell the story of your client. This is James M. Tume, the two-time Grammy Award winner, you know, killing me softly back together again, da-da-da-da-da. you got to be able to sell. And you have to get those people interested in your clients. It's not about going to the parties for the photo ops. It's about the day-to-day -day wares of the next level. Always remembering grassroots, never leave out grassroots, but let your clients grow into the apex of their success. So give back is important. Well, thinking about your legacy, tell me about the important milestones that define your legacy. Um, I would have to say, yes, again, excuse my redundancy. It's my message and my faith and my belief in God. It is James M. Tume. It's the teachings of my mother and my sisters that allow me to be who I am. All of that rolled up together is dynamic. You can only win. You can never, ever fail. When you have faith and belief and a body of people who are around you that truly understand you, not those people who are sometimes friends, because if you take the word friend and split it in the middle, you're going to get the end of a friend. I don't need a, I got a friend in Jesus. When I know that the people who are around me love me, care for me and is going to be a providers for me and, and better through it all when the downtime comes that you have people in your life that's going to love you no matter what and take you to the next level of your life that's what's really important those are the milestones and the climbs of life for me circling yourself around people who actually care not about your money or what you can do for them but they care about who you are and now you stay. And I'm going to uh, ask you another question that goes right into what you said, but I want to interject something. Um, but you don't need to respond because our, our, our audience has been seeing the same things that I have seen. Um, we notice what you have done with Miss Warwick, Dionne Warwick. Wherever you look, there's something about her. And you just said who you were always being in the background. So that's an important thing. One tiny part of your conversation that we can all take away from as well as what you've done for success of successful people and bringing them back to the forefront because we usually throw away things 
and this you do not allow. Now tell me about your books and candles. I, um, well, let me just say this with regards to Ms. Warwick, there's not just me, it's a team of us collectively. And, and I can never ever take the credit of anyone's growth. It's always going to be a team of people that we have a meeting of the minds uh, that we're going to see where the problem is, explore the problem and go for it. So I just want to make sure that there's great, Miss Work has great, a great body of people around her. She has an incredible niece that does a lot of social media. That's Brittany. Her son, Damon, is her manager. There's me and there's some other people that work together to, to make this magnifying uh, example of life. So, yeah. So I want to make sure that everyone always gets his or her credit. And so, yeah. But, yeah, there, Angela is a contributor into that. Yes. And what was your other question, Ms. Foxworth? About your books and candles. Oh, I have, <laughs> I've, people have made me write these books and I've done two books and I'm working on the third book. The first book was Axe Angelo. Mary J. Blige has, Dion Warwick has, DMX has, and Alicia Keys has. And so this book, the first book, which is a bestseller, uh, really talks about what I did to aid in the system. I'm never going to sit back and talk about their personal lives because that's crazy. But I want people to know what it took for them to grow. I give everyone an imaginary maturity pill. And I tell them, take two of these pills two times a day and a big glass of water and grow up. You have to become responsible. This is what you said you wanted and you got it granted. Now you got to keep it. So when you go out, you got to look like that picture that it took us 18 hours to grab. You can't go out like, uh, uh, you got to look like that picture. So you begin to teach them diction and speech and mannerisms and how to sit at a table, all the stuff that maybe your parents should have taught you. That's what I did in my 24 week artist development program. So I'm proud of when I see this girl who did, never ever wanted to do an interview now being a a Oscar nominee. And when I see her on television now, I'm like blown away. So you remember when I said to you, it's not about instant coffee. <clears throat> I like brewed coffee. So Mary has had the taste of my brewed coffee and she's developed herself to be this winning icon to this day. And I think it's marvelous when you can have self-awareness and begin to pull yourself up from your own strings, see what you were doing wrong and know now what you're doing right. And so that's that book and it just gives you insight. And then I wrote a book called The Sense of Success. And then I did a candle line with The Scent of Success. And I, I really believe that And this book, The Sense of Success was really about uplifting people who feel that they have failed in their life. You know, there's that there's that singer who was a one hit wonder. There's that lady that came out of jail and can't get a job. It's the guy uh, that can't get a job because he was in prison. Whatever the situation is, I just believe that you have time to recreate the will, to give it another, give it another fight. Put on those boxing gloves. Get together what you need to get together to be positive to go out to claim your victory. It's never too late, never too late. And when these people start talking about, oh no, you're never too late. Live your dream and make your dreams the realities that you want them to be. That's where it just begins and that's where it ends at. I don't care if you're 89, 99. If you have a dream to go back to school, you have a dream to conquer this, people call it bucket list. I don't believe in no bucket list. Do what it is that you want to do that's going to make you happy and be original in it. Be original in it. Love, I tell people, I'm so romantically in love with Angelo Ellerby. I love me some me because if I can love me, then that means I can love you a little bit better. I will teach you how to love me. And you will teach the next person how to love you. That's what it's about at the end of the day for me. Right. Absolutely. And and you are 
doing what you are speaking, which leads me to ask you about your projects to help communities from the Black Fairy Godmother to your work on the global issue of HIV AIDS. I stand in the forefront of HIV and AIDS uh, because I've seen so many pe people come and go. I've seen people be so ashamed of the sickness that they will not go to get help. I've seen mothers and fathers throw their children out of their homes because uh, however you look at it, it's real and it needs to be treated. I joined in the efforts of Dionne Warwick as she fought for uh, to raise money and to educate and motivate people to the awareness of this disease. I remember many years ago, it was in, back in my family, my mother didn't understand about HIV or AIDS. And I remember having some friends over one one day for, uh, we were having tea or something. I was must have been discussing the fashion show or something. And I was going downstairs with these cups. My mother pulled me by my collar. She said, are you going to down there with them cups? I said, yeah. I, I closed the door and I set her down in the chair. Don't do that to me, mom. I want you to understand. It, you cannot get it that way. And it's still people to this day believe if you kiss someone, if you hold somebody's hand, no. We had to erase all of that and we're still erasing it. And so it's really important for me that I stand in the forefront to really educate people about HIV and AIDS and to tell people there are organizations out there that will help you. If you don't have insurance, there are organizations that will take care of you and give you your medicine. And it goes on and on and on and on. It's, it's just a God thing. You know, if, we, if, you're, if you're calling yourself a child of God, you cannot sit back and judge someone's life or lifestyle. Who are you? As long as God, and you believe that God has accepted you as one of his children, this is what that's his doing. That's not an individual's doing. So I am nothing but a vessel in the work in the word of God. And so, yes, I'm in the forefront of it. And I will continue to be in the forefront of it until there is some kind of cure. There are so many people that are still dying of AIDS in the year of 2022, it's not cool. It's not right. So yes, I'll continue to fight for it. And I am glad that you are doing so because I know when it began, I lost a lot of friends and uh, I was a part of Visual AIDS Act Up, came out of the gallery that I was the director of. But let's go on to some other things since we're on this subject. What work have you done in the LGBTQ community and what messages are important today? Well, I served as a executive or the chairperson for GMAD. I think it was like in the 80s. My job was really to inform people about the sickness, the illness, uh, educating and motivating them to get educated and not be afraid to talk about it. There are people that's afraid to talk about God. Why are you afraid to talk about God? Why are you afraid to talk about your illness? My mother used to tell me a closed mouth is an unfed mouth. If you don't open your mouth and let someone know what's wrong with you, you're gonna stay in that condition. She used to say, how am I supposed to know you, you're hungry if you don't tell me? And so it's the same message with, with me holding that position I wanted to go into the streets, highways, and byways and tell people of the importance of the sickness and the disease. That's what was important for me to do. And I continue to do it because there are such closed minds to this. People are ashamed. They don't want to be associated with it. They don't want to go to the doctor. They, they, they just believe that they're going to be conquerors and it's just going to cure themselves. No, this is just no claim. There's no shame to your sickness. Say what it is and do what you need to do to make yourself better. And so I try to be the, the engine in the car that allows the vehicle to move with understanding you have to have fuel in order to move that car. Okay. And 
And the last question, because we have to uh, end this amazing conversation, educational and spiritual uplifting. But if your mother was here today, what would she say about the person you have become and your achievements? Free. The first thing my mother would say, my last born, my last boy, because that's what she would always say. My, I say, hey, mom, hey, it's my last born. Um, I remember my mom's passing, and I stood over her grave as they lowered her in the into the ground, and I said to her, you always told me that you wanted me to be great. You always told me that you wanted to be greater, wanted me to be greater. And mama, I promise you, I will strive for greatness each and every single day. And so I fight that fight still to this day, attempting and trying to be the greatest individual that he has made. That's what my mother would say to me. Be great. Thank you. And thank you, Maestro Angelo Ellerby. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today on the Foxworth Theory, which airs every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Thank you for joining the Foxworth Theory.